Well, good morning to you. My name is Stephen, and I have the privilege of pastoring this great people. I want to welcome everybody, but especially if you're new here with us, welcome to Grace Covenant. In 2007, a group of parents in Ashburn, Virginia, formed a group called Club 2012 for their African-American middle school sons. The club was a response to a troubling trend that the parents had observed. After one or two African-American young men had been suspended for behavioral issues, the parents noticed that all the African-American boys at Eagle Ridge Middle School were treated as a monolith. They were suddenly all under intense scrutiny and suspicion. They were passed over for awards. They were denied the opportunity to take more rigorous classes. The parents' response was organized, it was exhaustive, it was relentless. They hosted homework clubs at their homes. They would show up unannounced to dean's offices and teacher's offices. They would write letters discussing their, what the teacher could expect of their boys' Um, academic achievements and pledging their unlimited support. They calculated the group's GPA, having the boys hold each other accountable to ensure the group's GPA didn't slip. They took them on trips to UVA and to Howard and to Harvard. Most of the teenagers weren't too thrilled about their parents' involvement. One group member named Cameron says, I was kind of annoyed, to be honest to always have to look over my shoulder and see my parents in the dean's office. But the results six years later, when the men graduated from high school, were stunning. 100% graduation rate, 92% enrollment in AP classes, a cumulative 3.7 GPA, which that was before, you know, now they kind of inflate the GPAs with, that was before all that a combined $1.3 million in college scholarships. One of the young men, Corey, actually attends our church, and he's become a good friend. He's founded a nonprofit called Hearts of Empowerment that exists to equip communities with tools and resources not easily or readily available in D.C. In fact, his nonprofit was just awarded $150,000 a grant from the Walton Family Foundation, the Walton family of Walmart. And he's leading some of the most inspiring and impactful work amongst youth in our story, in our city. The story of Club 2012, or Excellent Options as the group is called today, is so compelling because it's an eye-opening example as to what it takes to positively form a group amidst intense opposition. Now, we've been going through a series called Meet the Family. Week one, we looked at God's vision for marriage from Genesis chapter two. One man, one woman in a marriage covenant till death that the Apostle Paul says profoundly and mysteriously pictures the relationship between Jesus and the church. And last Sunday, we looked at family dysfunction, where it comes from, what we can do about it. We looked at Cain and Abel, Genesis chapter four, and saw that family dysfunction goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, and it lives inside of each of us. And the only remedy for our family dysfunction is through the blood of Jesus Christ. He has the power to transform our own brokenness and the brokenness in our families. What we're gonna look at today is how a family of faith is formed in a largely secular city like the one that we find ourselves in. Now, for some of you today, uh, you're forming a faith in a nuclear family, so this is incredibly relevant for you. You have kids, you have teenagers, you're thinking through screen time, discipline, your kids' sports and activities, you're thinking through your family's priorities and how you're going to train your kids in the Lord. And for some of you, this is going to be relevant Not maybe now, but pretty soon. Okay, don't elbow your spouse. If one of you is hoping to have kids, the other one's not on board yet. But if you're, if maybe you're engaged, if you're, if you're dating, 
um, maybe even if you're single here today, but you have a desire to, ha- to get married and have kids, this is going to be relevant to you in the near future, perhaps. And so this is a good time to think through these things. And for others of you, maybe the topic of parenting doesn't have direct relevance, but you're supporting families in a direct and meaningful way. Maybe you're a teacher, you serve with children's ministry, kid builders, what we call it. Maybe you have nephews, nieces, grandkids, and you can play a vital role in supporting healthy families. So today I've broadened the scope of my message a little bit. I've intentionally titled the message, How Faith is Formed, because instead of strictly limiting our topic, our focus to parenting, we're going to expand it to include what all of us have the opportunity to do. All of us have the opportunity to form a spiritual family, a family of faith. If you're involved in a small group here, if you're serving on the AV or hospitality team, children, maybe you're in the superhero, the real superhero production we talked about a moment ago, even if today is your first time here at Grace Covenant Church, you are being formed and have the opportunity to help form this community of faith. So very simply put today, what does it take to form a family of faith? For some of you parents here, what does it take to raise children who will become adults with a resilient faith? I'd imagine if you're a parent here, um, you understand how daunting of a task this is, especially when less than one half of kids, eight through 12 years old, believe that their faith is important. Eight out of 10 kids believe that it's by being a good person that'll get you to heaven. Two-thirds of children believe that Jesus sinned during his earthly life. Only one-fifth believe they have a responsibility to share their faith with others. The spiritual state of our kids reveals that, by and large, we're not doing a really great job at this as a church. And most parents realize this. Only one out of five parents feel like they're doing a good job raising their kids spiritually and morally. Now, the famous American abolitionist Frederick Douglass said it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. How many of you heard that quote before? So how can those of us who teach in schools, who serve in kid builders, who have nephews, nieces, cousins, grandkids, how do we help young men and women who love Jesus and serve their communities? How do we form kids into adults who do that? How can every person here be formed and help form a spiritual family of faith that will help us win Washington, D.C. to Jesus? Week one was about the ideal vision for family, God's original design. Last week was about explaining the broken state we find ourselves in. But today, we're going to roll up our sleeves a little bit. We're going to get our hands dirty. We're going to figure out what it takes. And to do that, we're going to look at quite a large family, actually a nation, the nation of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. And really where Israel is situated in their history and God's instruction to them is the perfect case study for our topic today. So let me give you a little bit of context. Israel had come out of 400 years of Egyptian slavery. They had been inundated with polytheistic Egyptian culture. Then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they were to enter into a promised land that was occupied by the Canaanites, who also worshiped multiple gods and even sacrificed their own children on the altars of these idols. God had miraculously delivered Israel through 10 plagues in Egypt. They had seen his his power when he parted the Red Sea. They had seen his provision when he provided manna and quail for them in the wilderness. He gave them a moral code in a spectacular fashion when he appeared on Mount Sinai with smoke and thunder and lightning and the sound of a loud trumpet. But now there's a next generation of Israelites who weren't alive for those supernatural moments. They didn't see when God gave the Ten Commandments 
to Moses, save Joshua and Caleb. And so that's what Deuteronomy means. It means second law. It's literally the retelling of God's law to a new generation who desperately needs to hear it. It's God repeating his instructions. It's a solemn call to this new generation to love and obey God. It's a call to form a spiritual family. So where did God begin? The key to forming any group amidst intense opposition is to have a creed, a key belief, a North Star. For Club 2012, it was this unifying belief that these parents held that their kids deserved the same treatment as any other kid at that school. It's what drove them to create this group. For Israel, their creed could be summarized in verse 4, this one short line, what's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Israel's deliverance from Egypt was God proving to them that he was God alone. One by one, God asserted his superiority over Egypt's gods through these 10 plagues. Despite the polytheistic culture that they left and the polytheistic culture they were heading into in Canaan, God commanded them to hear, to shema him. And to hear is not just to allow the words to enter into your ears and go out the opposite ear. It's not simply to listen. It's tatamount to obey. And while the Ten Commandments served as a summary of all God's commandments to Israel, the Shema served as an even more concise summary of those Ten Commandments. If you were to ask an Israelite, who is God? If you were to ask them simply that question, they would most likely respond with this line. It was their North Star. It was their creed. It was their belief distilled in one line. So they have this central belief that God is one. And in response to this creed, God charged Israel to live lives worthy of the manner of what he had done for them. He gave them this command that served almost as a mission statement for them. He says in verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That was Israel's all-consuming, everyday goal. When they woke up in the morning, they were to commit themselves to one loving God with all their heart. The seat of their intellect, what we might call our minds today. They were to love the Lord their God with all of their soul. The, that invisible personhood, including their will and emotions. They were to love him with all of their might or their strength, the physical aspect of their personhood, all of who they were, their thinking, their will, their emotions, their decisions, their physical actions were to be in harmony toward loving God with everything that they had. And in a sense, nothing has changed about who God is and about what he expects from us. This is the mission statement of every family of faith whether a nuclear family or a spiritual family like this church, in response to God's uniqueness, that he alone is God, we are to love him with all of our soul, with all of our heart, with all of our mind. As a part of his book, Revolutionary Painting, sorry, Parenting. <laughs> Revolutionary Parenting. Painting was a sequel, I guess. George Barna, the founder of the Barna Research Group, combed through 20,000 personal interviews to find adults in their 20s who had a vibrant relationship with Jesus. These children saw, now adults, saw the Bible as the word of God. They were involved in a church. They were serving in the community. They were leading transformed lives. And after identifying these adult children, Barna tracked down and then interviewed their parents. And the results of his study was unanimous. 100% of what he calls revolutionary parents 
believed that the most important responsibility of their parenting was imparting godly character to their children. Those parents saw teaching their kids about God and his word as more important than the kids' education, financial security, extracurricular activities, sports. In fact, he found that there was no correlation between a family's financial income and their kids in terms of their devoutness to God as they grew up. These parents weren't looking to outsource the spiritual formation of their children to the church or to a Christian school, but they saw forming their kids' faith as their responsibility. And I would add, for those of us who don't have kids, don't, have, don't plan to have kids in this season of our life, I would add that the same responsibility to help form faith in others applies to every single person here. It's the Great Commission. Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that he commanded. The commission to make disciples or to form faith in others isn't directed to pastors alone. It's not just restricted to parents, but it's directed to all of us as disciples of Jesus. The church, you and me included, is in the faith-forming business. But how do we do that? How do we help form faith in our children, our nieces, our nephews, our cousins, our grandkids, our godchildren? How can we be formed by and help form our small group or our service team in this church? That's the great challenge for us all. And here's what God says to Israel and to us today. Verse 6, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Now, we use this expression today. For something to be on our heart means it's presently at the forefront of our minds. It's not something that we were thinking about maybe a couple of years ago. It's not something that like maybe used to be important to us. It's not something that we're too busy for or lesser of a priority. It's something that preoccupies our mind and influences our actions in the present moment. See, God knew that it's so easy to get distracted and to lose sight of our mission of loving him with everything that we have. It's too easy to get hurried and miss opportunities for faith formation. As human beings, we're never in neutral. We're either being formed by God or something else or someone else is forming us. So how do we ensure that God's word is always on our hearts? Look at verse 7. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. God's process for faith formation can be summarized in one word. Immersion. Immersion. Now, I took five years of Spanish in eighth grade and four years of high school. I learned all the vocab. I learned the grammar, right? I say this with great embarrassment to some of our Spanish teachers who are here. But my Spanish, um, I, won't, I won't expose myself in this moment because it's not that great. But I was always amazed that if I spent one week in Latin America, in Colombia or Peru on a missions trip, I seemed to grasp Spanish more in that one week than in five years of formal education. Because I didn't have a choice. I was immersed in that language. I woke up hearing that language. I had to force myself to talk in that language. I had to sound like a first grader because nobody else could understand the language that I natively spoke. And that's the power of immersion. What's being described here, this faith formation doesn't take place in one hour on a Sunday morning. It doesn't happen over a spiritual retreat, over a weekend, or on a week-long missions trip. The forming that God is speaking of takes place little by little, every day in the ordinary, mundane moments. It takes in the place in the morning when a mom or dad begins their day with a few moments of reading the Bible in prayer. 
It happens at the breakfast table with a quick prayer before all the kids wolf down the food. It's reinforced in the car when the Christian music is playing. It's layered in at dinner time when a family sits down for a few minutes over a meal. It's formed at bedtime around a bedtime ritual of baths and book time with younger kids. It happens in a small group when some ladies get together after church and eat lunch together and discuss the sermon. Or when some guys meet up on a, on a morning and work out and pray together. Or when the AV team decides to memorize scripture. Or when the real superhero actors and actresses go through the book of Mark together. The image here is not one moment of powerful dynamite. But rather an engraver who chisels away at a sculpture bit by bit. No stroke by itself seems impressive. Lots of tiny movements that feel meaningless and underappreciated and insignificant, but permanently form an unalterable living monument of faith in a person. And Barna's research reveals that this is not happening, by and large, in the Christian families in the West today. His research shows that fewer than one out of ten born-again families read the Bible or pray together during a typical week in America. Look at verse 8 and 9. God wants to make this as obvious as possible. This is formation for dummies right here. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You know what struck me about God's wisdom in these two verses right here? That this timeless command, written thousands of years ago, is literally the same advice that best-selling authors and experts are giving today. Take, for example, psychologist Adam Clear in his New York, best, best, New York Times best-selling book, Atomic Habits. He talks about the power of our environment when it comes to shaping our habits, We think of habit formation primarily as about our motivation. If I'm really motivated, I'm going to stop doing this or I'm going to start doing that. But his research shows that habit formation is more about our environment. It's more about making things as obvious as possible. That if we want to eat more apples, the best solution is to put the apples on the table where we see them. When they're buried underneath the fridge or inside the fridge, We forget about them. We don't eat apples. We need to make this as obvious and as clear as possible. And that's what God is telling Israel. Make meditating on my words as easy and obvious as possible. He tells them, bind them. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Because think about it. We use our eyes to see and our hands to do almost everything. Jews would literally, during that time, bind parchment with these verses written on them and wrap them around their arms and around their foreheads. Now, we don't do this today. I'm not suggesting that we start. But what has wrapped itself around our hands and our foreheads today? Not words from tablets of stone like ancient Israel, but words, pictures, videos, on our tablets and phones. And as a disciple of Jesus, we have to grapple with how these things, these devices are forming us. They serve an important for, uh, purpose. I'm not saying we get rid of our phones, right, and go back to uh, like the Amish territory, but they have more of a forming power than we often realize. Consider their effect on children. Children spend anywhere between three to seven hours daily in front of a screen. Smartphones are replacing childhood activities like playing outdoors, time with friends, reading books. Here's what one pediatrician, Michael Rich, how he describes the addictive power of smartphones. He says, virtually all games and social media work on what's called a variable reward system, which is exactly what you get when you go to Mohegan Sun and pull a lever on a slot machine. It balances the hope that you're going to make it big with a little bit of frustration, and unlike the slot machine, a sense of skill needed to improve. 
Excessive smartphone use is altering children's brains, impairing sleep, increasing the risk for anxiety and depression, and putting, at, putting children at a risk for cyberbullying. Not to mention the exposure to sexual content. One study shows that 42% of online youth users have been exposed to online pornography through their devices. Now, I realize all parents you know, are giving their kids phones and tablets. We allow our kids to use phones and tablets at certain moments. Most of the time, most parents are doing this without any kind of supervision, without kind of any rules. Again, I'm not saying these are inherently bad or that we shouldn't have them. But if we're, Christian, if we're going to be Christian parents who are attempting to form our children with God's word, instead of allowing the culture to form our kids, then we have to think through this pretty seriously. I know it's a bit daunting. It's like, where do you even start? But there's some really good resources out there. The Wait Until Eighth Pledge empowers parents to rally together to delay giving children a smartphone until at least eighth grade. Maybe you have a different standard. That's fine. Here's another approach. Considering children will eventually come to an age where they'll most likely need a smartphone, author Justin Early in his book, Habits of the Household, suggests curating what we allow our kids to watch on our devices and where parents have times and places where smartphones are off limits but allow usage in controlled environments. That seems like a happy medium. And the effects of smartphones and tablets aren't just limited to children. If you don't have kids, think about how your devices are forming you. I mean, as a pastor, I'm like working on my sermon. Boom, I got notifications going off. I got things going on. It's hard for me. I get distracted very easily. And as a church, a spiritual family of faith, we need to, to read books like 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You or The Tech Wise Family. We need to have these kind of conversations and come up with a plan with how we can use devices in a way that aids us in our formation of Jesus Christ in us. So you're probably realizing at this point that forming families of faith, whether in a spiritual sense, like in a small group, a service team, church, or at home, it doesn't happen hap haphazardly. It happens with a lot of intentionality. It happens with a lot of hard work. It takes making this your priority. And I can kind of see in your faces right now, you recognize the problem with all this. This is hard. And we're not really good at this. And Israel wasn't very good at this. Like, they failed at this pretty miserably. They got to the promised land, and they were formed more by the pagan nations around them than they were by God's word. Time and time again, they didn't love God with all their being. They didn't immerse their families and create environments where his word was easy to find. They were a lot like us. How do we, how do we even start? Where, and this feels impossible. How do we do this? There are so many times where I don't love God with all that I have. Can anybody identify with that? Yeah. Where I get frustrated at my kids. Where I miss opportunities to teach them about God's word. Where I say something hurtful. Where I'm lazy. Where I'm just exhausted. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know if this is even possible to start in a small group or a service team when we live so far apart, when we're so busy. Maybe on a personal level, you're thinking about times you've been formed by other things other than Jesus. You feel powerless to get free from an addiction or a sin. Is there anyone who did this well that we can look to to emulate? Like even just one person. And I think this is where the metaphor of language can help us. Because in learning a language, there are three basic elements. There's the alphabet and the vocabulary. Secondly, there's the grammar or the rules of a language. And thirdly, there's fluency. And fluency is the goal. It's where you can speak the language with spontaneity, with creativity, without thinking. You start dreaming in that language. The passage today... And the rest of the law, the first five books of the Bible, are the alphabet and the vocabulary of the Christian faith. 
The prophets, book like, books like Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel, they're the grammar. They're how to apply the law in various situations. But we need a native speaker, someone who's achieved fluency to show us the way to formation. And we have that in Jesus Christ. Jesus acknowledged the Father as God alone. He lived up to the Shema perfectly. And as the Son of God, he was one with the Father. He submitted his life completely to God and was the only one who has ever loved him with all his heart, soul, and mind. He taught his disciples the word of God, not missing a single moment to form them into a spiritual family. He was the perfect native speaker who formed the family of God, even at the expense of his life. And then he arose from the dead and secured the right for all of us, despite despite our repeated failed attempts to please God. He brought us into God's family, despite our sin. That is the gospel. That you can't form anyone into anything that even resembles God in your own strength. You're powerless to do this. I'm powerless to do this. Except through following him. By allowing the native speaker to be our guide. By allowing his sacrifice on the cross to cover our repeated failures. He can help Those of you who are parents, form a family of faith, one seemingly mundane, ordinary moment after another. He can help us as a church support nephews and nieces and cousins and grandkids and students. He can help us in small groups and service teams form spiritual families of faith. You might be thinking, Pastor Stephen, what do you want me to do? For some of you today, Some of you parents, I want to challenge you. Maybe you pick up one of the books in the lobby. We're not making any money off this, okay? I'm not trying to hawk books. But you pick up the tech-wise family. You pick up habits of the household. And you have a conversation about how, what's one thing we can do? What's one thing we can do to bring more of Jesus into our home? Dads, maybe it's starting with saying a prayer at a mealtime with your kids. Maybe it's starting with once a week having a moment with your family, where you read the Bible together, children's Bible, five minutes, or a devotional for teenagers. Maybe it's saying, you know, two times a week, three times a week, we're going to sit down as a family and eat dinner together. For those of you here in this church who maybe you're in a service team, you're in a small group, what's one way that you as a group can be more intentional about forming faith in each other? Maybe you start memorizing scripture together. Maybe you have a group members meet up one-on-one and pray together and have lunch together. Maybe if you're not involved, you're like, what is a small group? What is this? What are you talking about? You're speaking another language. Talk to us after church. We'll get you connected. And thirdly, we want to support our families at a very high level. Families in this community, families here. We're starting a nursery, our goal by January, because we've had people come to our church They have kids two and under. We don't have anything for them at this point, so they don't come back. We want to start a nursery for the babies so moms and dads can hear the word of God. We want to have a team of volunteers that just does child care for our membership classes so our normal team on Sundays doesn't serve on Saturday and Sundays. We're looking to expand our kid builders team. What if we had a church that believes so much in the next generation that we had to turn people away from serving in children's ministry? What would our workplaces, our schools, our neighborhoods, what would the city look like if we immersed ourselves in the words of God in our small groups and service teams and encouraged each other to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength? What would our city look like if we raised and supported children who love Jesus with all of their being? What would our city look like if those children had healthy marriages, who had godly, they had godly children of their own one day? They served in their workplaces. They gave generously to meet the needs of our city. They boldly preached the gospel to neighbors and coworkers. What if we had to turn away people from serving the next generation because there were so many people with hearts to pour in and to invest into that good soil? I think we could see the city warm. 
I think we could play our part in seeing Washington, D.C. transformed. Investing in the next generation is the long game. Sometimes you don't see the immediate results, but that's how shit cities are shaped and formed. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you. God, you've given us a blueprint to form godly spiritual families and families, biological families. Lord, I recognize that parenting is hard work. It's hard in the midst of our, our normal nine-to-five jobs. God, there's so many times we don't feel like we have anything to give to our kids emotionally, spiritually. Maybe we feel like we don't know enough. But I'm asking that you would inspire us today. Lord, I'm looking in this room, so many folks in their 20s, maybe single, dating, engaged, some who've married, who are married with no kids, who one day will have kids. And I pray you inspire them by your Holy Spirit to make parenting a priority, to train up children who will be world changers, who will make a difference in this community, who will be children who grow up to be courageous men and women of God, disciples of yours. Lord, we're believing you for a children's ministry at this church that's busting out of the scenes. That kids would drag their families to church. They would drag their unbelieving parents to church saying, we gotta go to Grace Covenant Church, Capitol Hill. That's where I encounter Jesus. That's where I have the most fun. Lord, I pray that you would create a spirit of volunteerism in our church that we wanna lay our lives down for the next generation, for teenagers, for kids. Lord, this is your strategy to form families of faith, to make disciples. So empower us as a church to do that. If you're here today and you recognize that you're not able to form others because you yourself haven't received that gift of faith and you want to make a decision to commit your life to Jesus today, would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. You raise your hand, you can pray after me. Say, Father, I'm sorry for the way I've lived. Today I choose to turn from my sin and believe in you. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for my sins. Come into my heart, change my life. In Jesus' name, amen.